So today's threat actors, um, there's a lot. So just kind of walking through these sort of, you know, clockwise. There's the negligent insider. So again, it's somebody that doesn't, you know, maybe one of your employees that, um, you know, leaves their passwords written down on a sticky note somewhere and, the, you know, the janitor happens to walk by or, or, or somebody that comes in from the outside. Um, or it could be that they leave, you know, a laptop or a cell phone or a USB thumb drive in a cab, you know, or on a bus or, or anywhere else. Um, sort of the opposite of that is a malicious insider. Uh, and that's really somebody that, you know, maybe a, a disgruntled employee um, that has, you know, bad intentions, if you will, um, and that, that can take various forms. There's hacktivists. So anonymous is one you may have heard about. These are folks that, um, you know, are typically tied to some type of a movement. Uh, you know, it could be environmental, it could be political, it could be really anything. Uh, but these are folks that are looking to sort of get their message across through hacking of, you know, maybe a big oil company or something along those lines. Script kiddies. Um, so these are, what's happened is, what's interesting, if you look back, you know, not even that long ago, five, six, maybe seven years ago, most of the hackers had to be really sophisticated in a, and actually be able to write code and, and do some pretty high-end stuff. The reality now is, though, that a lot of, you know, so you got to love capitalism. Some, you know, developers saw that that was the level of sophistication that was needed, and they said, well, I'm going to go build, you know, software applications that are specifically geared towards hacking, and I'm going to sell those. So I'm not going to be a hacker myself, but I'm going to make a business off of selling that, you know, those applications, and that's what um, script kit is. So these are basically, you know, generally inexperienced folks that, you know, just like you, you, you know, you sit down and start using Microsoft Office products, they sit down and they start using a toolkit of, of you know, hacking um, components. Nation states, um, probably, hopefully not one you guys need to worry about, but you never know. Um, cloud third-party compromise, something that a lot of people don't think about. You know, most everybody um, that we deal with is using the cloud, you know, from some perspective. Um, and by cloud, I mean, you know, like Amazon Web Services or or Microsoft Azure, so one of those types. Um, how do you know that the controls that they have in place are adequate and aligned with really your controls? And then criminal hacker, and this is the one that makes it, you know, most of the news, um, and these are the folks that are, you know, for criminal intentions, uh, actually, you know, breaking into your networks and, and stealing your data. So anatomy, so all these slides, uh, I'll, I'll send these to Barbie afterwards as well, so you'll be more than happy to share the, uh, a copy of this with everybody um, or anybody that's interested. So step one, and again, there's lots of variations in this, but this is kind of just the, the sort of typical. Step one is research, you know, and, and it could be research of targeting the people, you know, looking on LinkedIn, Facebook, um, who, are the, who are the players, who, who's the head of school, who is the um, business officer, who's the head of development, um, who's the head of IT or, or, or lower levels than that, um, as well as trying to, you know, there's things that you can do to see what um, what platform maybe the website's built on. Um, and basically, it, it's, they're doing research, you know, in all aspects. The smarter that they are about your organization, then the more tailored and more targeted that they can, they can make their attack. Step two is the attack. So this is, they're, they're using that data that they collected, that research that they gathered, um, to then exploit either through a network vulnerability, um, which could be, you know, a variety of things, or some type of a social attack. So maybe you get that, you know, that email that has, that looks legitimate. And I'll talk, I'll actually show you an example of one. Um, it looks legitimate, but the reality is all they're trying to do is get you to navigate to a site, which will then install, you know, a piece of malware, or it could be that it has an attachment in it. So it could be a picture file, it could be a, you know, Adobe, it could be anything. Um, and, and so once they do the attack, then they exfiltrate the information. So they're inside, they take that data out. So you might ask what data would they want, you know, from your organizations. Um, here's some examples, you know, student health records. Again, medical records are very lucrative on the, the black market, on the dark web. They create an identity. I see, so stealing someone's identity, you can do insurance fraud, you can do lots of, of really interesting things. Um, donor records, um, so probably all of you have development offices. I'm sure you, you, you probably keep the, the donor records or who those individuals are that, um, that support the, the schools very close, you know, for obvious reasons, those individuals probably don't want that information out, at least the sensitive, and then you don't as well. Family financial records, you know, whether it even just could be financial assistance. Uh, and then any really, so, so those all probably fall into 
you know, either PHI or PII, one of those categories, so there's like legal, you know, requirements. But quite frankly, how many of you would like your budget or your strategic plan or your enrollment numbers or, you know, pick something that is of significant value to you as an entity exposed? Um, and again, keep in mind, it, it may be that they're, they're just gonna publish that, so, you know, they, they may feel some, you know, higher calling on why it's important to share your enrollment numbers, so it's not like they even are gonna ask you for anything, they're just gonna take it and then publicly make that available. And that, which is the last thing, actually. Uh, using the exposed data. So it could be, you know, typically it's for financial gain. Not always. Um, it could be, you know, higher level attack. Could be they're trying to extort something out of, um, out of an organization. Um, you know, it really kind of depends, but this is sort of the traditional. So an example, um, I don't have, this is a little bit of an eye chart. So I actually, um, last summer, so this is about a year ago, um, a friend of mine, um, sent me, you know, in quotes, an email, um, and at first glance, and it was just to me, so it wasn't to a group, um, we probably all have received sort of, the, you know, the Nigerian prince, prince kind of phishing emails, or, you know, I'm on my deathbed, and I want to send you five million dollars, you know, reply, I mean, those are pretty obvious, but this is an example of one where somebody did quite a bit of research on this particular friend of mine, um, and this is a friend who I only probably talk to maybe two or three times a year, and it's generally through email. And so just some, just to give you kind of a taste of, of how sophisticated some of this can get. Uh, at the top here, so, and this is not his name, um, and, and I'm not gonna tell you if it's a man or a woman, although I think I probably already have, but. Um, so they, you know, if you were to, let's say John Hill at AOL.com, if, if that was a friend of yours, and they sent you an email, and I could go create a separate, you know, virtually or you know it would appear duplicate email address and just by adding an L. How many, how many people are gonna visually pick up on that? Probably not too many. Um, they also um, took a look at their Facebook page and they travel a lot, this friend of mine. They, they travel a lot to very unusual places. Um, and so they picked a place that she had visited um, and, and I knew that and they picked it off of Facebook. So again, it starts to start making it more personal. Uh, they also, I live kind of in the middle of nowhere, you know, in the country, the country um, setting in Maryland, and there's some local banks, you know, two or three branches, they picked one, and that's a bank that I know that they bank at. And so, um, again, just making it more personal. And then last but not least, they included their home address and phone number, and it came just to me. And so I, uh, you know, if, uh, hopefully I can catch these things. Um, I caught it and I tried to call him and he was traveling, which again, no surprise, but I wound up getting a hold of his wife and, and explained it to her and she was very concerned that you know someone had been able to, through public information, been able to get this type of information. Um, and really what he was looking for, what the individual was looking for was um, some money, you know, that he was, you know, the story is if you can't see it, was stuck overseas, lost his, um, you know, lost his passport and needed a couple thousand dollars. There's some tells, I mean, this isn't very well written, so, you know, uh, uh, all uppercase, so as part of our employee awareness training, when we do those, you know, there's things you can look at flagged. Um, you know, most Americans don't put U.S. dollars, at least not like that, not that I've, you know, not typically seen. Um, capitalized letter in kind of the middle of a sentence, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so, but again, they clearly went to, you'd think they would pay someone to do a grammar check or a, if they're gonna go to all this trouble, but for whatever reason, they don't. Um, so switching to some data, there's tons of data that's out there. Um, this is just some highlights, I guess you could say. There's a couple reports that I like in particular. Verizon publishes an annual, and they've been doing it for several years, which is why I like it, because they, they talk about trending. Um, there's a Verizon data breach report. So this is looking back at 2014. So the 2015 or 2016 report will look back, um, and that'll come, in about, come out in about six months. So in 2014, as you can see, there were just under 80,000 security incidents. Um, you, know, you can probably count maybe on both hands now, but um, the ones that make the you know, mainstream media are included in this number, but you can, the point is there's a lot, you know, tens of thousands of more um, security incidents that are happening that essentially go unnoticed. Of those, so again, difference with member between a security incident and a data breach, of those, a little over 2,100 were actual data breaches. So this is where data, you know, was exposed to someone that, that was not authorized. Um, they ranked the top 20 industries. Congratulations, you guys are number 12. Um, both in both security incidents as well as number of breaches. So they look at it both ways and, and education um, is number 12 in both. Now, now keep in mind the disclaimer there is 
it, it includes secondary, you know, K through 12, secondary. Um, so there's probably quite a few universities. Universities are, you know, super attractive to a uh, bad actor from an intellectual property perspective, um, as well as from a, a medical record perspective. About 85% of the threat actors were external, you know, so that, that malicious outsider. Um, but 15% is still internal, which is a big number. So that's somebody leaving, you know, maybe an unencrypted laptop or something like that. Um, you know, and exposure to that information. Phishing and spear phishing. How many people have heard that term before? And I actually just gave you, have you guys? Okay, so, so phishing is abroad. So if I were to, you know, try and go, um, you know, hack your organizations, my team would put together kind of a phishing campaign, if you will, we do research. But we would broadly, you know, go after probably the entire organization under a phishing campaign. Spear phishing is, is the exact opposite of that. I'm still going after your organization, but I'm, I'm probably going after all the individuals in this room, you know, so very targeted. So maybe heads of school, the head of school, um, you know, the finance, the business officer. So um, much more targeted, maybe CEO of a company in a private setting. Um, software vulnerabilities continue to be a big problem. So little known secret, um, as you probably figured out, you know, and Microsoft's gotten away from this a little bit, but, you know, Patch Tuesday, which is when patches, Microsoft rolls out patches, a significant percentage of those patches are to address security vulnerabilities in their software. Um, and they don't advertise that because obviously that's not good business. They want to tell you about all the great new functionality and features that you're getting. But the reality is that, you know, that is part of why they're doing it, but a big part is to close those doors. Um, Apple actually will not tell you that if there's any security. So if you ever go back and look at any of your Apple updates, if you ever read any of those, which no one does, you'll see that security vulnerabilities or security updates are probably not mentioned anywhere. And it really makes sense. So Apple feels that they don't want to give the bad guys any insight into what they're doing. So some software developers say, we fixed, you know, we closed this loophole. Well, the reality is most people don't react that fast. And so it really gives the threat actors or the bad guys uh, kind of a blueprint on how to get in. There, there's a national database, which I won't bore you with, but where all these vulnerabilities are cataloged. Um, and they're, they're, they're basically stamped. So like any vulnerability found in 2000, 2015 would be, you know, 2015 dash a number. We still find when we do assessments, you know, vulnerabilities have been around for literally 16 years. And that just means that people aren't patching, they're not doing the, you know, appropriate things. Um, everybody always wants to fixate on like smartphones. You know, I have a smartphone um, as, as, a, as a big vulnerability. The reality is that the bad guys just aren't there. There's so much low hanging fruit on, you know, the traditional side, the non-smartphone side, that it's easy for them. Um, and we, we really haven't seen a lot of targeting in that regard. So another report that I like, um, this is a company called Sukunia, and, and they, they specifically, they actually sell a product which we use, but uh, it basically is a single dashboard for maintaining um, or looking at all of your programs and making sure that they're updated. It runs on a local app, a local computer. Um, and so what they do is they publish this report every year, and this will just show you. So this is just in one year. There were over 15,000 vulnerabilities across, you know, almost 4,000 or 3,900 um, applications. And when I say application, I don't mean some, you know, down in the weeds kind of arcane system. These are probably names that you recognize, you know, Google Chrome, Adobe Reader, Windows 7, which is the most widely deployed operating system um, in the world. And we're seeing an uptick. So the, the, the bad news is, is the software companies aren't getting better at quality control. They're actually getting worse. Um, and so you can see 18% increase. And then of that, the, the way the vulnerabilities are, they're bucketed into like, you know, extremely critical, highly critical, medium, and low. Um, about 11% were in one of the top two categories. And really the, 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 the guidance there is to address those literally immediately. So you might ask, this is all really kind of cool stuff to know, but how does it relate to my school? Um, if you haven't already kind of connected those dots. So again, PII and PHI we talked about. Um, actually, I think maybe all of this, um, you know, donor records, budget, those types of things. Those all may be of interest to someone, um, and, and, uh, and maybe even your students who are probably pretty sophisticated. Um, but sort of switching, you know, gears a little bit. Another popular thing is, you know, defacing your website. So maybe you have a school that has a particular mission with someone is, you know, in a disagreement with. Um, what would be the impact to your organization? Like websites are like Swiss cheese. It's like the easiest way to get into an organization. I mean, there's no web developer that I've met yet that kind of feels that security is part of their, you know, responsibility, their creators, their designers. And that's great, but the reality is 
um, it'd be really easy to take someone's website down or deface it and maybe put up some you know, counter messaging or something that's offensive for a variety of reasons. Um, could be that they also, you know, what would be the impact of ransomware? So if you're not familiar with ransomware, it's, you know, I encrypt your data, I hack into your network, I encrypt your data, or maybe I even lock down your website, and I say, you know, give me $1,000 and I'll give you the key to unlock it. Super easy to do. The FBI actually recommends that you pay them. Um, you know, that was their latest guidance because it's so hard to, um, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to recover. If, it, if you're already in that situation, it is relatively easily prevented. Um, through a ver you know, there's a variety of things that you can do. So some examples, these all actually occurred within the last, I think it's three weeks now, um, but just to show you, so this was students in Long Island, um, and I didn't pick on New York, they're, 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 you'll see there's a couple other examples, um, but these were, if you remember Ferris Bueller's Day Off, um, these students, through, they, they, they snuck in through, I guess, a centralized computer where they kept the grades and everything, and they actually installed what's called a key logger. So I could put a piece of software on your computer that captures everything you type. And it either saves it in a file, which I retrieve later, or I can set it up where it'll, it'll you know, email it to me or, or some other method. And so they did that, and they were able to get access to the grade system, and they went in and changed their grades. Okay, so real example of, I'm not saying any of your students are bad, but you know, kids will be kids kind of a thing. Clearly three smart individuals. Um, but not, you know, not that smart that they didn't get caught. Another one, very common one, you know, here's a, a USB drive that was lost. This actually had uh, donor information and stuff on it. They didn't know if it was encrypted or not. Um, and then they, through their own research, they figured out that it wasn't encrypted. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't protected. Thumb drives, you know, the beauty of them is they're very portable. The, the bad part is they're very portable. They're easy to lose, stick them in your pocket, whatever. Um, and so here's again, another example. Um, and then the last example, this is, a, this is a university, but it's still relevant. So they had one of their HR folks had sensitive health records on their computer um, that they don't know if it was encrypted or not. It was supposed to be, but they're not really sure because they don't have the records to, to prove that it was. Or that, um, so here, you know, so they have to assume that that um, that, that data was then exposed. Um, so here you can see 9,000 individuals that were affected. Again, those all occurred just in the last three weeks. I didn't have to look very... You know, I didn't have to look very hard. Um, so the reality of today's information security, um, and there's lots of stuff in the news about all these really cool, sophisticated things that people can do, but the reality is that most organizations just don't focus on the basics. And this is really where I think you can, um, you know, get a big bang for, you know, basically, you know, no buck, if you will. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. When I talk about good IT security hygiene, this is just really basic, you know, password management, um, making sure that your employees have, you know, some type of annual security awareness training. There's lots of things that you can do that are, are really what I call the, consider the basics um, before you get into even any of the, the most sophisticated stuff. And quite frankly, for the environments you're in, it's probably the things that, that make the most sense and give you the biggest bang for your buck. Employees are always going to be the weakest link. There's, th th I mean, that that's just goes without saying. Uh, humans are prone to errors, um, you know, either intentionally or unintentionally. And that's just the reality. Um, and this is not unique to schools, by the way. None of it, this is unique to, to, to everybody that we, we interact with. Um, a lot of times people jump on the technology side, but there's really a big you know, people and policy side to it, which I'll talk about. Um, and, then, and then from an IT perspective, it's really not kind of fair, if you will, to consider you know, an IT person uh, a, a really great you know, security engineer, because that's not really what they're doing 99% you know, of their time. Um, they're generally stretched thin from what we see. Um, and also a lot of the freeware security related tools, the companies have gotten smarter and now they're charging exorbitant amounts and they're trying to take advantage of kind of the environment. So here's where the video comes in. So trying to break this up, um, I thought there's a couple videos that kind of just sort of prove my point on where we are from a, you know, focusing on the basics perspective. So I've got a couple videos, hopefully this will work. I've never done this in a presentation. No, we've been hearing a lot about cybersecurity lately, largely because of what happened to Sony. Companies and individuals are more concerned about the safety. Oh, shoot, sorry. Let me go back. This is why I don't do this. No, we've been hearing a lot about cybersecurity lately, largely because of what happened to Sony. Companies and individuals are more concerned about the safety and privacy of their information than ever. President Obama 
has unveiled a number of new proposals this week to crack down on hackers, and he plans to address this in the State of the Union speech on Tuesday. And it's great that the government is working on this, but the truth of the matter is we need to do a better job of protecting ourselves. You know, the most popular password in the United States is password123. And as long as we're, as long as that's the case, we're vulnerable. So today we sent a camera out on the Hollywood Boulevard to help people by asking them to tell us their password. And <laughs> this is how that went. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. But, and have you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, oh, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh, my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight. And then Israel. It's it's only three, but it's you know it's uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland, one two three four. Gemma, one two three. Spell G E M M A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Like so what, like. Like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your uh, grandma's name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So Maria is your password. Oh, yeah, now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the important thing is he le they learned a... Um, other than pornography on the Internet, what for? All right, so the good news is Alan. Alan has a solution for everything. All right? So uh, this video, I love, this is one of my favorite videos, so you're going to you're gonna love this, I think. So. Last night I was flipping around through the channels and I saw this. I, I really love infomercials. I don't know if you love them as much as I do, but I found one. It's a new product that I want to share with you. And, uh, you know, if you have a hard time remembering your online passwords, a lot of people have a lot of different passwords. This is going to solve your problems. Online passwords. There's just too many. And who can remember all those tricky combinations? So you stick them on your monitor or you hide them in a drawer. But not anymore. Introducing Password Minder, the personal logbook that takes the This is a real product, by the way. Forget about sticky notes or scraps of paper, because Password Minder has been specifically designed to organize and safely store passwords. You'll find them in an instant and never lose a password again, guaranteed. Need to make a password? Just add it to your Password Minder. The alphabetical listing organizes all your usernames and passwords for instant recall and easy reference. I don't have to worry anymore about security or identity theft. I now have all my passwords in one place. It's great. If you have passwords, you need Password Minder. So call now and get your very own Password Minder book for just $10. That's real. That's real. Wait, you're telling me I can keep all my passwords in one place? In this right here and it's only $10? For half the price, you could write all your passwords on a $5 bill. <laughs> this is insane. Does this seem safe to keep all your passwords in one place? In a place that's labeled Internet Password <laughs> Minder? I don't think they thought this through fully. I mean, what if someone gets their hands on your password minder? So I came up with this. It is Ellen's Internet Password Minder Protector, and what you do, yeah, you put it in here, you close it, and then it has a built-in combo combination lock right there, you see on the side, and I know you're thinking, Ellen, what if I forget my combination? Well, if you order now, I will include this, you can put it in there. It's the password minder protector minder. <laughs> Is 
It's the one place to keep your password mind to protect our combination. And I have one more special offer. If you don't feel like writing down your passwords, send them to me. <laughs> and for $10, I'll write them down for you. Don't worry about sending me your credit card information. I'll figure it out. <laughs> oh my God, can you believe that? So, so that really is kind of where we are today. So I always kind of laugh when people talk about all this like fancy stuff they're gonna do. And you know, that's, hum that's the human piece. Um, so real quick, because I know I, uh, just to get through, um, you know, about 20 minutes left, uh, an interactive question. So I always really, uh, you know, always one of the things that we always think about is how can we kind of get the, the message across about protecting data, but in ways that, you know, non-technical folks, um, you know, can uh, kind of understand and relate to, because if they can't relate to it and they can't understand it, then they're probably not going to go take any action. Um, and so a lot of the principles of what, you know, kind of come with protecting data uh, are really things that you're probably doing in your, your life, your, your, you know, your current home life today. So what are some of the things, you know, anybody has any ideas, I, I gave an example up here, that you're doing to protect sensitive information, or maybe it's your, you know, your loved ones or whatever in your homes today, you know, or your, your apartments, resident, whatever. Um, what are some things that, that, that you guys can do from a security perspective? Yes? Shredder. Shredder, that's great. Okay. So a good way to think about it is if you kind of, and again, I'm not going to walk through each of these, but a lot of the things that you're doing today to protect your homes or residences and probably your organizations as well, there's generally a direct sort of comparison or correlation between what you should be doing as an organization. Um, and, and there's lots of things. This is, again, sort of the highlight. But, you know, everything from locks on doors, you know, signage, which could be, you know, group policies, keep out, no trespassing, um, a dog. And some of you got to see, I have, you know, three dogs. Um, they let me know when anybody gets, you know, within, feels like a mile of my house. Um, there's a direct sort of, you know, analogy on the, on the security side of, of very, you know, technology. This, uh, this slide's focused on technology that directly kind of relates to, to those. Um, and, and so you can kind of see, again, these will be available, you know, after the fact. So looking at it from people in policy perspective, you know, so maybe you have individual keys, um, which could be that you have, you know, privilege access. So you have certain individuals that are allowed in certain parts of your organization, um, or you have, you know, multiple, you know, different sets of keys, if you will, in your home. You've got, you know, one for the safe and one for your front door. Um, alarm system code, so maybe um, you allow, you know, certain individuals into part of your house and not others. Um, stranger danger awareness, you know, if you have young kids, probably relate, you know, most of you can relate through your, you know, your schools. There's training that you do, you know, to kind of educate them on what they should or shouldn't do if a, you know, a bad person tries to, to reach out to them. Same thing applies on the security awareness side. Um, annual fire drills, those types of things. So I, I always encourage folks to kind of think of it this way because it sort of demystifies a little bit of some of the things. I'm not saying you understand maybe all the terminology on the right-hand side, um, but really, again, a lot of what you're doing in your daily lives is super relevant to your organizations. Um, so some unique academic challenges that, that we see. So we do a fair amount of work with, um, as I mentioned, schools in general, public and private, is really balancing the functionality and the security. And it's even more, it's true in any organization, but it's how do you, you know, protect your data while not inhibiting the learning process, you know, and giving your teachers access to the tools and the technology that they need and that they want, as well as the faculty. Um, and so some things that you can do, segment your network and data storage. Think of your, your house again. So you probably have one room that has more valuable, you know, assets in, in it. And, and so that room maybe has a stronger door on it, stronger lock. And so doing the same thing, so making sure that your, you know, your financial data is kept in a more secure fashion than maybe your school schedule or something like that. Um, you can really, you know, you can develop um, or deliver security awareness training that's tailored to the user audience, you know, so students versus faculty um, type of thing as well as tailor the security policies. Um, one of the things that, 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 that we always are faced with is teachers always want to try out new applications. You know, they want to try the latest, greatest thing, and, and there's a lot of value in that. So you don't really want to, you know, you don't want to necessarily stop that from happening or inhibit it, but there has to be some rigor around it. Um, there's lots of applications that sort of are masquerading as, you know, education related, and they probably are, but what you don't know is underlying that there, there's some inherent security flaws. Um, and, and they're probably completely transparent to most of the users. 
And so what we recommend is really kind of a cross-functional vetting process for applications. It doesn't need to be anything super formal, but you know, a teacher wants to, you know, there's a new application, you know, maybe even a smart, you know, smartphone device uh, application or something along those lines that they want to try out. It shouldn't be where they can just go download it and start using it and maybe sharing it with their students. There has to be some kind of a discussion around that um, with, you know, probably IT involved if you have a separate technology department, which you know a lot of organizations do. Um, just the, the the various stakeholders, um, and then also communicating that out. You know, making sure it's great to have. It's not very good to have a process if people don't know about it. Um, you also have probably you know a really significant number of guests coming and going, you know, whether it's parents, whether it's maybe international students, guest students, maybe you share resources with a adjacent school or something like that. How do you, um, again, give them access to what they need to so that they can learn? I mean, that's, that's why you guys are there, um, to, to develop, you know, them as, as individuals, but at the same time protecting your, your assets. And so, um, you know, you can create, you know, at the simplest level of production and a guest network and really kind of compartmentalize off kind of what they have access to. Some other challenges, you know, limited budgets, everybody's limited, um, probably some more, some less, um, which then translates often into minimal IT staff. Um, so you can use an assessment to really identify where you can get, where can you get the biggest bang for your buck. Um, so, you know, you're focusing your resources where you can get the highest value and, and also where you can, you know, it most likely to succeed every organization is, is different in, in sort of their priorities and risk tolerance. Um, policies need, you know, you, again, as I mentioned before, kind of that cross-functional vetting process for applications. High usage of social media, um, you know, the reality, social media is not going away anytime soon, and, you know, students can, th can get themselves in a lot of trouble really, really fast. Some of you probably have stories of that already happening. Um, but just making them aware, you know, of the implications. A lot of times they don't know kind of what they don't know. And that's true for teachers and faculty as well, or administrators. Um, and then what we also see is most organizations have gone to BYOD, bring your own device. You know, so how do you, how do you try and protect your data, but yet you've got, you know, dozens, hundreds, you know, of devices coming into your organization that you really have no control over. And so you can set minimum, you know, very basic kind of minimum security standards to sort of go along that, you know, kind of drive the folks down the right path. So some specifics, so we always look at this, this is a little bit of an eye chart, but the, the message here is, I always say cybersecurity is really a team sport. And so everybody in your organizations at your schools has a role, some more, some less. Um, but the, the point of this slide is everybody always wants to jump on the technology and the IT folks. And most of the times it's, it's rare that, you know, I can't even think of one where, you know, the IT department or individuals, they want to do the right thing. They understand it, but they're limited, you know, in a variety of ways, 24 hours in the day, budget, all those things. And, and really you could invest a lot of time in that specific area, but the reality is there's a whole lot more that comes into, you know, kind of comes into play to really protect your data, you know, physical security and that. So that really, you know, kind of just sort of proves the point. I call it the ecosystem, if you will. Um, it's just a lot of contributors besides just technology. So defense in depth, something, again, I won't talk through this, but just think of, again, that layered approach. And so you're really building, so maybe you're encrypting your data that's sensitive and maybe you have um, your application locked down. Um, so these are just sort of a way to build into your infrastructure. And you're probably doing a lot of this today. You, you may just not even know it. Um, but again, this is just that layered model so that the bad person that's on the outside that's trying to get in, you know, sort of logically has to go through all of these to get to here. And that's really what we're trying to accomplish here. So I sort of already kind of shared this a little bit earlier when we were looking at the, the kind of that the house analogy um, but we really preach three pillars you know and I purposely put technology at the bottom because again people are the weakest link so every member as an, of the organization has a role you know humans are always going to be the weakest link there's very little you can do to to change that um, you can definitely improve over time um, policies and procedures super important if you don't have it written down and it's not shared, you know, it's not written and stuffed in a drawer somewhere or on a server that no one has access to, um, you, you really can't force your, you know, students, faculty, administration to, you're going to force them to guess. And that's probably not the path you want to go down. Um, and then lastly, really the technology needs to support the organization's policies. 
It shouldn't be the other way around. You shouldn't have a tool dictate to you what your policy is. You need to pick tools that are supportive of what your desires are as, as heads of school. So how do you do it? There's really no one size fits all. You know, the right solution is different for every school. If I could, you know, interview, you know, every one of you, I would probably find out that the environment at your school is different, the budget's different, the risk tolerance is different, the user community is different. You know, there's lots of differences even in, you know, an audience like this. And so you really need to take a building block approach. There's no, you know, one thing you can go do. We have, you know, organization we work with, they develop a five-year plan. Um, you know, or three-year plan and, and kind of say here, you know, we can afford to do this little bit now, we're gonna do this, you know, next year, th so on and so forth. Data classification, you know, one of the big things that people don't realize is how many of you know where all the data is, or, and I'll, I'll even make it simpler, all the sensitive data is within your organizations, where is it kept? It, you know, maybe that if it's on a single server somewhere, that's awesome, um, probably unlikely. Um, how do you protect data if you don't even know what it is and where it is. And, and honestly, how do you then deploy your resources correctly and effectively so that you're not paying to, you know, secure your school's calendar or something, you know, or maybe the directory, although there's some value in that from a some a social engineering perspective, but how do you make sure that you're deploying those, you know, resources the most cost effectively? Well, if you don't know where that data is, you, you probably aren't, or if you are, it's probably by luck. Um, IT security audits and assessments, probably everyone gets, I'm sure everybody gets, uh, you know, annual financial audits performed. Um, you know, really the, the, the industry sort of trend is that, that now, you know, start thinking about annual IT security assessments. Um, you've got, you know, some organizations are looking at doing quarterly, um, not, not any schools, you know, larger private industries, but they're sort of moving towards that model. Um, leverage existing technology, I, I, I was talking to Bob outside and, the, the reality is we, we rarely, and vendors, we, we're vendor agnostic, which drives some vendors, you know, some of the hardware software folks nuts because we, we, we don't get paid by any of them, um, and so we're super objective. But we rarely recommend buying additional technology. Um, it's, it's how do you optimize the technology you've already invested in. Um, in most cases, what you've bought is probably even overkill, to be honest, for what you need. Um, and so it's making sure that it's set up correctly. Educating your organization, you know, security monitoring, just like you have that ADT home system, you know, the bad guys are trying to get in 24 by seven, um, making sure that you've got somebody that's kind of watching on a, on a, on a daily basis um, when folks are trying to break in. And then incident response planning, um, you know, in the event that it does happen, do you know what to do? Do you have, you know, an insurance policy specifically for that and, and what are those steps that need to be taken? Um, so just some, I won't, in the interest of time, I won't, I'll, I'll touch on some best practices and then some potential pitfall, pitfalls that we see. Um, so best practices, again, adopting policies that, that really communicate how you want your organization to store, um, you know, transmit and destroy sensitive data. Uh, I was looking through the, the NYSAIS accreditation um, guidelines and, and there's some language in there around that. Um, one thing I thought that was interesting was the prep checklist is the, the, the school that, um, is gonna be audited, they ask that you provide USB thumb drives, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, it, it doesn't say anything about encrypted or anything, so I'd be curious on how that's handled. Um, really make your students and faculty part of the information um, security program. You know, raise their awareness. The more they know, the better off they're gonna be able to, to help you. Um, develop a crisis management strategy and define roles, you know, who's responsible for what. Uh, don't try and, you know, figure that out after it's already happened. And you can, part of the way you can raise awareness is just through you know, newsletter ads, you know, fun facts at staff meetings. There's lots of very innocuous, you know, ways that you can raise awareness. Um, and then also your parent and alumni will really appreciate that. Um, that's one thing that we've heard that was sort of a, an unintended benefit, if you will, um, of, of schools. Uh, the, the parents really appreciated what they were doing. Um, and then safe browsing and social media at home. Technology, um, I'll touch on just a couple of things. You know, bad practice to charge your mobile devices. Um, be your laptop or desktop computer and USB. How many of you do that? Probably a lot of you, um, especially if you're iPhone users. There's malware that, that sits on the smartphone and they don't really care about your smartphone, but they're just waiting for you to plug that in to a personal or work computer. They don't necessarily care. And then it uses that, that, that cable, that USB cable is kind of a bridge. And so what it's really going after is your computer, not your smartphone. So it sort of lays dormant, if you will, and then kind of jumps the gap. 
How many of you use the Mohawk Wi-Fi? Everybody. How many of you walk to the f or, or read the literature to see, you know, what the actual, you know, it's called an SSID, but the, the network name was? Probably not very many. So I could very easily for about, I think it's about 90 bucks now, set up a fake access point that looks just like that. All of you would have connected to it, and anything you would have transmitted, I would have been able to see. Um, and so when you go to conferences, you know, really keep that in mind. So you go to Starbucks, there's probably one Starbucks wireless network there. If you sit down and there's multiple, you need to go ask McDonald's, you know, pay, I'm not a, you know, I'm not advocating for Starbucks or McDonald's, but um, those types of things. Um, the last bullet, uh, we actually had <laughs> an organization we were talking to, um, they had just given access to their HVAC vendor from a systems controls perspective, access to their network. Um, which I, I guess is a common practice um, in some organizations. It's not a great practice, but because of them doing that, so Target was breached through their HVAC vendor. Um, they, they're going to go the path of least resistance. Well, if it's a, you know, a mom and pop HVAC or you know, pick a pick a, a vendor you have, it's an easy way for them to kind of get in because they're probably not taking security as seriously as you are. Potential pitfalls. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the applicable data breach laws, those are unique to where your, um, your student's residence, primary residence is. And so if you're a business or an organization that has um, you know, either clients in multiple states that you, that outside of where you operate primarily, so just because you're in New York, obviously the New York laws apply to you. But if you have you know, international students, it gets really complicated, but let's pretend you don't. Um, if you have you know, domestic US students from other states, and their data is exposed, you're not only subject to New York laws, but you're also subject to whatever state those individuals reside in. Um, and that's always a surprise to everybody. We actually have a guide for each of the 47 states and the three um, um, territories, if anybody would be interested in that. Um, we've got one for New York. I'd be happy to share that. Um, at the end, my contact information will be. Cyber insurance, more and more people are starting to buy cyber insurance specifically. Just keep an eye out on all the exclusions. Um, mobile device is a big one, mobile device encryption. If, if, you, you know, if your policy says that all devices have to be encrypted, um, if you have a breach, that device wasn't encrypted, you're not going to be able to file a claim. Or in some cases we've seen where maybe the device um, you know, was encrypted, but then they come in and do an analysis and find out that not all of your devices were encrypted, they may still not pay the claim. And so the, the insurance companies are getting smarter and smarter and getting you know, really kind of ratcheting that down. Something we see all the time is single shared admin usernames and passwords. You know, could be even, you know, and not even think IT here. It could be maybe your finance folks share. Maybe they have one system that they access or maybe, um, you know, a donor database or something like that. Uh, and then cloud storage contracts, you know, really look at those closely. Most of them also are stripping out any kind of liability shield. So you, you give all your data to them, but you're still liable ultimately at the end of the day. And oh, by the way, we're not going to give you access to any of our systems um, in the event that it's breached. And so there's ways, a really simple solution for that is encrypting the data before you, up, before you upload it. So some key takeaways. Um, I know a lot of information in a reasonably short period of time. Uh, the reality is data breaches can happen to you know, organizations of all sizes and industries. It's kind of a given. There's lots and lots of examples. Most organizations have actually probably already had some type of a breach, and they don't know it. Um, and, that's, and then again, that's just kind of the reality. Um, you need to be looking at this on a regular basis. There's lots of really simple things that you can do, cost-effective things. Again, just from an awareness training perspective that you can do that will really significantly improve your um, security posture. And anybody that stands up here, like me or any, you know, any, any, anyone sort of in this field, anybody that tells you that they can guarantee that you won't have a breach is flat out lying. And we've had clients say, or prospective clients say, what I want you to guarantee me, and you can't. Because again, it goes back to, you know, even if we did all these great things, all it takes is that one employee to do something that, you know, wasn't intended. Um, and so really the focus is on minimizing the damage um, as much as you possibly can. And then lastly, kind of be proactive. Again, it's a team sport, so I, I applaud everybody in this room for, you know, sitting through my presentation and hopefully getting something out of it. Um, but then going back and, and educating your teams. And so again, this